Hi guys, welcome back to RPM Technic, it's Tim here, and today we're continuing our story about geometry. We did a teaser video showing the basics of it, but I'm with Greg now from RPM Technic who gets asked all of your questions, so I thought it was good to bring him in to further the discussion. Greg, what do people say? What do they want to know about geometry? Well, a lot of the time people get their geometry report back with all the five or six different aspects of it. Yeah don't really understand it, but say thank you very much and off yeah. they go. So the first one we usually get asked about is camber. Yeah. Well, the reason people ask about camber is because they see racing cars with loads of negative camber on the front wheels. And mm -hmm. so they know that equals performance, if you like. Um, but I think it's important to set the, set the bar where cars come from from the factory. Cars are set in a very generic, safe way, mm. um, particularly if they're 911s with the weight hanging out the back, all of the past stories over the, the history of 911s about uncertainty of handling on the limit. Mm. So cars have to be set in a safe way um, for all drivers in all conditions. Mm. And that means they're not optimised, if you like, for performance. Yeah. I'm not saying the performance isn't great, but they're basically set up to have a very safe breakaway on the limit mm -hmm. because that means there's more feel for the driver. Yeah. And this goes right down to the tyre selection, why tyres are end rated for particular cars. It's because they have a characteristic mm -hmm. that suits that car. But back to the geometry, the geometry is set so that on the limit, the car will tend to understeer first to give a driver some initial warning rather than it rotating and swapping ends. Yeah. Um, but back to your question about camber, the reason that the cars don't have too much camber on as, as a standard setting mm. is A, so there's an element of understeer on the limit initially, but also because of tire wear. Yeah. Because the more tire camber you put on, the more you increase the wear on the inside shoulder because it's doing more work. Yeah. But the feel for the driver for, for more camber is that it will give you a, a much more alert steering response. Mm. Um, so on the road, the car will track a little bit more, it'll be a bit more darty, is yes. probably the expression yeah. for it. But on track, that translates into a sharper response to the wheel, so a better initial turn in, mm. a better change of direction through a chicane, and less understeer when you first hit, you know, turn into a corner. Because if, if we look at this wheel, obviously, as you were just saying, when the car's um, running negative camera, we can see it, it sits on the inner edge. Mm. And so we do get guys and girls sometimes come in that have had their service and they're surprised maybe at the tire wear, um, on the front especially. Mm. Um, and I explain to guys, it's because the cars all have a little bit of negative camber from the factory sometimes anyway. Mm. As you say, on the race cars, it's, it's angled over even more. Why on some of the, when you go to Goodwood or Classic Le Mans and stuff like that, when you see that some of the really old cars, mm. why do they have the camber facing the other way around? where they've got them cantered out either way. We're talking really old cars now. <laughs> yeah. Even before your time. <laughs> Nothing I've ever seen in here anyway. Um, but so, we're back to the London Brighton. Um, <laughs> basically, it's the way the suspension geometry works. Uh, it's just all, to, that's all, to, that's nothing to do with tyre wear particularly. Mm. It's just to do with very different suspension geometry. Yeah. Obviously, most of our cars now are a double wishbone suspension on the front with mm. rising rate suspension. Completely different to anything you, you saw on a, an older car. Yeah. So it doesn't really relate to any current model edition Porsches. Mm. The only other aspect of it is is actually tyre temperature. Okay. Because obviously a tyre has a good, a, a, an optimum temperature for working. And on track particularly, we're looking for something like a 10 to 15 degree tyre spread of temperature from inside to middle to outside. If you're racing, you're checking your tyre temperature, the spread as we call it, across the tyre, yeah. and changing your camber according to that. You could put loads of camber on, mm -hmm. and people say, well, where's the limit? Yeah. Well, the limit is when and the inside of the tyre actually overheats. Okay. So you get you then you then wear the tyre out too quick, not just wear, but in terms of performance. So you're looking for about a 10 degree spread across the tyre. And I guess if we if you take that back one step, even before you look at that, what we probably also need to talk about is, is tyre pressures. Mm. Because if you've got the you know in the example of a race car that is, is, is 
you know, fully pushed over. Yeah. Running too high uh, temperatures like we see on this, yeah. we haven't got a great big contact patch. So yeah. that's obviously a big deal as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously on tr track, as you load the car up heavily mm -hmm. and induce roll in the car, it then loads the tire more across the tire. The situation you see of the car statically with the camber on yeah. isn't actually replicated exactly in the corner because the car rolls. Oh, so it actually, yeah. and it pulls the outside of the tire underneath the t underneath. Mm. Um, but obviously pressure is is just as important, if not more important, actually than, than, than spread of, of temperature. Yeah. But you know, on, on track you generate enormous amount of heat in the tires, far more than you ever would on the road. Yeah. And that's that's why we have to reduce our tyre pressures to a workable level. Yeah. But when we've got camber um, being changed on the back of the car, yeah. does that have a big impact or not? Yeah, camber on the back of the car tends to increase um, sort of mid-corner stability. Yeah. So once the car, once you've turned into the corner and taken the set, as I call it, so yeah. the weight is transferred on the car, mm -hmm. you've done that initial turn in, yeah. you come off the brakes, you're about to get back on the throttle and the car is settled. At that point, you're relying on that rear grip and that camber to maintain you know, the, a stable set. You don't want it to break away too fast, yes. um, too soon, it, you need to maintain that grip. But obviously the rear of the car is doing an awful lot as well. It's doing traction yeah. uh, through the corner. You, you've got a lot more adjustment as well. You've got toes, you know, backwards and forwards. You've got the, the, the width of the track. You've got the ride height. None of these things in isolation, you tend to adjust. You know, it's a package of, it's a package of changes. One effects the other. Exactly. Yeah. We can also adjust toe on geometries, which again, a lot of people skip over. If we start with the front, why would, why would we adjust toe? Um, toe is for uh, stability, particularly on the braking. Okay. So that's where you really feel it. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you have the front parallel, or slightly towing in, mm -hmm. so the front of the tire is, if the car's going forward, is towing in, exaggerated like that, you will find that the car is incredibly nervous okay. on, on braking. Mm -hmm. Well, that clearly is gonna affect your, your confidence and, and, and well, stability. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, a little bit uh, parallel or even slightly out can give the car a lot more stability. But it depends on the track. It depends, you know, what the braking zones are. If they're bumpy braking zones, braking on a corner, um, all kinds of things like that affect it. Obviously, again, toe will affect tire wear. Yeah. So, so right. we're talking about small degrees, really small degrees. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a that's a big effect on the front mm -hmm. um, stability on the braking. On the rear, actually, toe can also help or hinder your turn into the corner. Okay. So if the car is actually pushing a little bit, you can. I mean, race cars quite often run toe out on the rear. But I mean, particularly on a Porsche where you're looking for stability, mm -hmm. it's the opposite of that. So you run toe in on the rear yeah. to really stop that breakaway, that, that snappy breakaway. And is that why Porsche on the newer models, uh, GT obviously, uh, added in rear wheel steering to help or hinder that? Is that? Yeah, that it is. I mean, that's actually to make the car more alive in the slower and the medium corners. Yeah. So, because obviously the car inherently wants to go straight. Yeah. So they're giving you a little bit of an assist in the slow and the medium corners. So you get to a hairpin, so you've gone in a little bit too quick. Yeah. Instead of the car wanting to plow on because you're asking the front to do all of the turning, yeah. with a bit of rear steer, actually it just assists you round the corner. We've all seen a rear steer lorry or bus and if you know <laughs> it turns on its own axis. Yeah. So it's helping you in those corners. Mm. You don't want that in the fast corners because yeah. you, you actually want stability in the fast. So that's why it does the rear steer doesn't come into operation in fast corners. Mm. Caster is actually the angle of the of the of the hub, if you like. So yep. if, if the, up, the hub is, is is angled like that, the more you lean it back, is yep. the more is the increased caster. Mm -hmm. What you actually feel from a driver's point of view is just lighter steering. Okay, it's it's just a lighter steering, but it's it's really not something you feel hugely in the car. It's just part of getting the whole setup all together right. Cambers, cut toes, casters, ride heights corner weights, it's, yeah. it's a whole si system of putting the car together. With GT models especially, yeah. um, 
why we would change it from what Porsche factory settings yeah. were. Um, yeah. And obviously we'd be going to explain that, which is sort of more your world than ours on the yeah. circuit side of things. Yeah, I think it goes back to what I was saying. I mean, although a, a Porsche GT is probably a closer track-related product than um, your standard Carrera 4 or Carrera 2S, mm -hmm. um, it is still has to be built with you know, margins of safety in mind because they're going to be driven by anybody in all weathers, road and track, yeah. um, all over the world. So there is still an element of safety in their setup. Um, so whilst they are chasing lap times at the Nordschleife, and they could go potentially quicker, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the cars that set the times have got a track setting on them, they're probably <laughs> yeah. not as they roll out the factory, they still have to be um, set for safe, you know, safe driving in all weather conditions. I've had my GT3 reset for the track, yeah. um, and that, that was already a quick car. Yeah. But I have to say, on the limit, it had a bit too much understeer. I was happy to have it a little bit more pointy at the front, mm -hmm. lose a bit of rear stability because I can hang on to it. But it's, it's up to the individual. But don't think for one minute that a GT Porsche is perfectly set for the track when it rolls out of the factory. The other thing that you sometimes see on not just Porsches but cars generally, people like them low. Yeah. yeah, I mean, technically, the lower you can get the weight, the better the car is. Center of gravity. Is, yeah. Center of gravity is low. The polar inertia, in other words, the higher the weight. We're getting weight. testing out, Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you've got a really big, heavy head, that's polar inertia. That's <laughs> high up weight. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, the, you want the weight as low as you possibly can yeah. um, for that reason, because it helps with all handling. All mm -hmm. handling is helped by lower center of gravity. Um, I offer you the Subaru British Touring Car, which had the low flat four engine and had a huge advantage over everything else. Yeah. Um, so much so that they were forced to put weight in the top of the car balance to balance out. it out. Um, but yes, you're always looking for that. But obviously that comes within the, within the, the geometry of the standard suspension. Mm -hmm. It's all very well on a race car where you can design it on a piece of paper to run low with your suspension angles and rising rates and everything absolutely perfect. But you can't just slam a road car on the ground absolutely. and have your angles work correctly. Yeah. So there is, a, there is a limit and it's not very much actually that you can really lower um, a road car to make it still work. So that that isn't the, the, the Naverna, if you like, that, that you should seek in getting your track performance. I, you know, customers interact with us and talk about what would be a nice setup, and it'd be interesting to see what your, what your thoughts are. But I actually quite like my road cars set up a little bit softer mm. than people would expect mm. because with the roads that we've got around here, you've got, you've got potholes, you've got mm. broken roads with lots of off camber. And sometimes with a car that's a little bit more supple that works with the road, mm. you can actually drive it faster and safer to a point. Mm. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. I mean, everybody's feeling is different about actually how stiff they want their car. Yeah. Some people like to drive um, their performance car on the road, having it as stiff as a ball because they love that sort of connection. Mm. Um, it's not comfortable and it's not compliant and it's certainly not particularly safe if you then are driving the car in the wet or you hit potholes or dips in the road. You know, it really can almost jump out of your hands. It's yeah. not the ideal situation. The ideal situation is you've got actually got adjustable dampers and you can have them a little bit softer on the road, turn up at the track, a few clicks all round and you can stiffen it up. That's the ideal. But most people don't really want to get into that sort of degree of adjustment, I don't yeah. think. Um, and, and therefore it's important to find out what each customer really wants, mm. how much road driving they're gonna do, um, what they feel of, they like on the road, how quick are they on the track, being honest, yeah. and what do they want on the track. And to find the right compromise for each person, because it literally is an individual's personal choice. On that subject of, of coilovers, obviously it's, a, it's an aspect of what we do that's getting increasing popularity because initially a lot of lads come to us and say, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to improve my car, where should I start? And depending on the age of the car, suspension is, is the one that gives the most instant um, you know, uh, demonstration of something being changed. However, a lot of them are very reticent about having something that's really firm, and this is what we explained. By having a coilover, which is an adjustable setup, you can have the best of both worlds. 
Um, obviously, we run with the KW products, mm. and, and they work very well on the road and the track. But a lot of people also just like to keep with their factory standard suspension. Mm. Um, and there's with the Porsche equipment, a surprising amount of adjustment even in a standard car that you can make. Um, in terms of taking it on a circuit, I always find that a Porsche product in its standard form is really good mm. and that's where the value of the car comes to, to the front. How does that compare with other manufacturers, do you think? Well, you're absolutely right. And, and, and again, it comes down to the individual. And if, if I talk about my blue GT3, yeah. I have kept the Porsche um, suspension on it. I've, mm. I haven't put coilovers on it. Yeah. And that's because there's quite a big price to pay in terms of road comfort. Yeah. Okay. And, and for me, that road comfort is still important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I drive the car 90% of its time on the road yeah. and I want that sort of road car comfort. Obviously, you've got slightly adaptive dampers in that as well. Mm -hmm. Ideally, coilovers is the way to go. But uh, certainly for the track, but I don't think anyone would say my GT3 was slow on the track. No. <laughs> so, so, uh, so you know, it shows that the standard product will do it very well. Mm. But it just depends how much of a compromise you want to make on your road driving. And ultimately, yeah, fitting coilovers is is the best way to go, and and would would make my car faster on the track. Yeah. No question. I just personally don't want to make that compromise. Where I suppose it does sometimes come in is where you've got an older car and replacing the older suspension on that car Definitely. comes around through you know, wear and tear. Yeah. The option of fitting a non-adjustable uh, setup or yeah. a brand new 2020 fully yeah. really adjustable with new oil and everything in it, that's where it comes into its own. But even on a road car that yeah. you just drive on the road because we can knock it back to softer than factory to get back to that sort of suppleness mm. of the road. Um, so yeah, interesting topics there. Mm. Um, if there's anything else, definitely. We can talk about it, can't we? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Look forward to the comments.